just help us to distance ourselves from the daily frustrations that we may be thinking about or any other distractions that would pull us away from the message. And I pray, Lord, that the message would pierce our hearts, Lord, and that it would cause us to reflect on you and a deeper relationship with you. And as we walk out of this place, I pray, Lord, that each one of us will take to heart the one main point of the message, and that we would apply it to our lives, and in so doing, that we would be a light in a dark place, that we would be different, changed, changed for the better, in a way that would honor you, that would glorify you, and that would help your kingdom to grow and your renown to spread. I pray all these things in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, on a visit to the Beethoven Museum, a young American student happened upon the room in which a piano that Beethoven composed many of his great works on was located. And she turned to the guard and asked the guard if she could play something on the piano and giving him a very lavish tip, of course he complied and agreed. So she plunked out Moonlight Sonata on there and as she began to rise and, and begin to leave away from the room, she turned to the guard and said, I guess all of the great piano players uh, of this time are, uh, are excited to play on this piano. And this is what the guard told her. He shook his head and said, well, Paderewski, one of the great Polish composers, was here a couple of years ago, and he said that he was not worthy enough to even touch it. True humility. True humility. Folks, we need to understand what Paul means when he says your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And so our goal today as we walk out of here is to recognize the amazing demonstration of humility that Jesus Christ did when he came to earth as the God-man. God Almighty became the God-man. He indwelled flesh for you and I because it was the only way. And for us, we need to understand the truth of that humility and how it transposes in what we are to do as Christians. To better understand what I'm talking about, if you'll turn with me to the book of Philippians, as we continue our study in the book of Philippians, you can read along with me. We're in chapter 2 today. Now I'll begin in verse 5 of chapter 2 of the book of Philippians. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May God add His blessing to the reading of His Word. Just to give us a little bit of context of where we've come from here in the book of Philippians, Paul begins his letter and he talks about the importance, or the, his desire at least, for the Philippians to experience spiritual growth. And so he reaches into the lives of the Philippians, he writes this letter from prison, with his desire for them to grow spiritually in his absence. So whether he's there or whether he's away from them, his desire is for them to grow. He goes on to talk about the fact that his imprisonment is actually part of God's plan to spread the gospel. And for us, I'd like us to reflect on that and think, okay, let's say we're plugging along here with the gospel. And let's say that this is not 21st century America where we have freedom to express ourselves, freedom of religion, and we're incarcerated for our faith. What are we going to think? 
We're thinking, I'm limited now. I had a mission. I was on mission. I was performing a ministry. And now I'm being limited by being incarcerated, by being put in prison. What does Paul say? Paul says, this was to the furtherment of the gospel. How interesting for him to look at things in that perspective. It was one of those glass half full, glass half empty perspectives, you know. And so you look at everything either as a, as a problem or an opportunity. Paul saw this as an opportunity to spread the gospel. See? And he goes on and he says that he is conflicted. And this is a deep confliction in his life. He says, for me... To live is Christ, but to die is gain. What an insane statement to make. To live is Christ, but to die is gain. In other words, he says, I'd rather, I'd rather go on to be with the Lord right now. That's better for me. That's, that's what I desire to do. But I know that it's best that I stay. And so he chooses to stay. He chooses the thing that he knows is best for others over what he desires himself. Now, I know we don't struggle with that in 21st century America. We always do what's better for the other person, right? Oh, wait. <laughs> we talk about the shower test, you know, when we're in our shower. With, what are we thinking about? We're, we're, generally, we're thinking about us. We're thinking about our day. We're thinking about what we're going to do at work, at school, or wherever we are. Me, 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 right? What does the Apostle Paul do? He says, I'm going to set myself aside here. I'd rather go on and be with the Lord. But no, it's important. That I stay. Why? So that I can help you grow. I'm here for you and your spiritual development, your spiritual growth. To spread the gospel is why I'm here. That's why God doesn't just snap us up immediately. He doesn't regenerate you and immediately snap you up to heaven. Right? We're here for a reason, a purpose. And when our purpose is finished, friends, He will call us home. And to die will be gained. Amen? But he goes on and he gives this mandate of unity, particularly within the church. I want to pause for a second on, on this message just to talk. Last week, we had a very, very important message of unity. And I believe that the enemy thwarted a lot of people from being here for that. And in fact, I have a, this is on YouTube as well. And it's the least viewed of any of the sermons that are, on, that are on YouTube. The enemy has squashed this very important message. I want to encourage you, if you, if you have a computer, to go on YouTube. And I want you to, to view last week's message. Because it is a message of unity. And it's a powerful message. And what I would say arguably is one of the most important messages that the church at large can hear today for a lot of reasons. So let me encourage you to go back and, and, and view that, that message from last week. Very important. But he gives this mandate of unity, particularly within the church. And he goes on to say that believers should be looking out for the interest of others. That is unfashionable. Because, you know, most of us would say, even as believers... That if we don't look out for our own interests, nobody else will. <laughs> but if we're in an environment of safety, friends, if we're in an environment where, where we know that those around us are looking out for our best interests, it's more friendly to do that. But you know what? His mandate doesn't depend on that. It's a directive to you and I individually to, to make that choice, make that decision ourselves, to look out for the interest of others above our own. So if you will go back with me now to our verse 5, the first verse in our text today, and we'll look at that. So Paul charges his audience to keep, and see this is for, look at me for a second, this is for um, the importance of the grammatical component of studying the text, is you would, you would not understand what he's referring to unless you looked back at the previous text the previous context where he says that you should be looking out for the interest of others, that you should regard others more significant than yourself. Interesting. We're going to break that apart. But Paul charges his audience to keep what he just told them about unity and putting others' interests ahead of their own in mind. And he says this, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Think about the way that's worded. Which is yours in Christ? What's yours in Christ Jesus? The mandate of unity. In other words, the only way that you and I can be unified is we, we surrender to the Holy Spirit 
and in the control of the Spirit and allow the Spirit of God to work through us so that our decisions are Spirit-led decisions and not decisions that are born out of what we think is best, but what the Spirit is showing us is best for the furthering of the King. And so as he says, what is yours in Christ Jesus? Meaning that you need to surrender to the Spirit. Look at verse 6 with me. Paul continues and he describes what God the Son, Jesus, did through the Incarnation. So he goes on to describe that and he describes Jesus as God. He's very clear here to tell us that Jesus is God. And I want us to remember this, you know, because a lot of times as we look at Jesus Christ as the God-man, we look at the, with the salvific actions of Jesus and the things that he did on the earth and so forth, we, we tend to, to notice him in a way that is kind of not biblical. In other words, we look at Jesus as like the minion. You know, God sent him down here, you know, and, and Jesus did the bidding and he, you know, he didn't want to die, but he did it because, you know, God the Father told him to. And Jesus is this minion that just was obedient. We need to follow that because Jesus followed it and so we follow it too. Friends, Jesus is no minion. He's God. He is God the Son. We have God the Father. We have God the Son. We have God the Holy Spirit. They're all the same person. The same entity, they have different offices, and he is fulfilling this office. And so the Apostle Paul is very specific and very clear to describe Jesus Christ as God Almighty. Look at verse 7. In verse 7 is one of the most misunderstood texts in the entire New Testament. And it goes on, and a lot of scholars, there are pages and pages and pages about this, this next text that talk about you know, not, uh, not for anyone uh, understanding equality with God, not uh, to be grasped. And we take this out of context because we don't understand what the original language is telling us. And the way we read it is that you and I can't grasp God. And so Jesus Christ became who he was so that we could better grasp him. Friends, that's not what this is saying at all. And listen to me very carefully because this is a very big deal. Scholars go on pages and pages and pages and they talk about, maybe you've heard this word kenosis, which is the Greek word for emptying himself. And they go on and on and on saying, well, Jesus is God, but he limited himself. He voluntarily gave up things. We have to, Bible, Bible scene investigators, what context is king? What's the context of what's being spoken of? He's, he, Apostle Paul begins by saying that you and I are to value and regard others above ourselves. And now what he does is he goes on to give an example of that in God. What God did as an example. God's example of humility. God's example of what he did as Jesus Christ. Friends, Jesus Christ is God. He never ceased to be God for a second. He never limited himself. And what this text is telling us, it says equality with God, not a thing to be grasped. Let me help you. You go back to the original language. That word grasped really means to exploit. Listen to the way it says it now. Listen to this. Very important. Look at me. Equality with God was not a thing to be exploited. You see how different that is? See how the message changes, how we understand it in a completely different way. Jesus Christ came to earth and he is God, but he said, you know what? I'm not going to exploit the fact that I'm God by doing certain things a certain way. I'm going to, I'm going to lower myself because this is the only way for flawed humanity to be bridged to perfect God. This is the only way. And so I'm going to do what I have to do, what is necessary in order to make that happen. So he did not exploit who he is as God. He allowed things to play out the way, the only way that it could be. Does that make sense? Good. Verse 8. So he explains, Paul explains that Jesus took the form of a servant when he became God incarnate, the God-man. Now, friends, I want you to understand this. Let's, let's think about this for a second. We, you know, we go back to the, to the birth of Jesus. You know, we just came off of Christmas and, you know, the angel shows up to Mary and he says, this Holy Spirit's going to come over you and you're going to become pregnant. Well, the Holy Spirit fertilized Mary's egg 
in her womb. And so you have this DNA of this human woman and God. He is the God-man. He is the God-man. So what is he like? 50% God and 50% human? Well, let me ask you this. Are you 50% of your mom and 50% of your dad? No, you're a blending of them. You're all of your mom and all of your dad. And you have qualities from both. Friends, Jesus is 100% undiminished deity and 100% perfect humanity. He is the God-man. He is the God-man. And so what is being described here is this comparison of the God-man, of Jesus Christ, God Almighty, the all-powerful creator of the universe, lowering himself to become a man. And he goes on to describe, listen to what he describes. He says he humbled himself to the point of death on a cross. That's the worst possible death, friends. Jesus Christ allowed himself to be beaten with rods. You remember that, that hymn he could have called 10,000 angels? He could have. He could have stopped it at any point. Satan tried to tempt him to do it. Hey, don't let you dash your foot against a stone. Call your angels. Throw yourself down from the temple. But he didn't. He allowed himself to be beaten with rods. He allowed himself to be whipped the flesh ripped from his body, a crown of thorns jammed on his head, spikes nailed into his wrists and his feet, hung on a cross, suffocating, exposure. And if that wasn't the worst of it, as God, he took all of the sin of humanity, everything, every sin that was ever committed, every sin that ever will be committed, and he placed it on himself, the worst thing possible for God, but he did it for you and for me because it was the only way. And so this is a comparison contrast between what he did for you and I with what we should do for each other. That's what this text is about. It's not about kenosis. It's not about the limiting of Jesus. It's not about a poem or whether this is poetry or, or, or what have you, like scholars run down all these paths and write pages and pages about, friends. It's a comparison contrast to the all-powerful creator of the universe came to earth and became a servant for you and for me. And then the apostle Paul says, live like that. That's what you and I do. You become dirt. You become a doormat for others. That's what he says. Verse 9. And so it goes on to say that he is highly exalted. His name is above every name. And friends, this is not a reward. See, again, we get this idea that Jesus is the minion and that he obeys and God says, good job, Jesus. Hey, we're going to exalt you now. No, no, no. He's God. The point is, it goes on to say, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And so it's just proof positive that that's what he deserves. That's who he is. But look at what he did for you and me. Look at what he did. So this confession is to the glory of God the Father. And so God Almighty is glorified as a result of doing what he needed to do, what was necessary for you and I. What is necessary. And this idea of, of limiting himself, you know, that, that word kenosis, is not a giving up of certain qualities. God never ceased to be God for a second. He is Jesus Christ, God the Son. He never ceased to be God for a second. He never did not possess all of the qualities of God. The idea of this limiting is called meekness. And meekness and humility go together. Humility, we have to consider it in the, in the context of meekness. Let me give you a, a, a perspective of meekness. Perhaps you watch uh, National Geographic from time to time. Maybe you see tigers in the wild and they're raising their young. Hopefully that's still happening. You know, there's a, you know, a species that's, that's uh, endangered now. But you see these tigresses, and they've got these little tiger cubs. And these tigers have these huge teeth. Could destroy you, with, just chomp down you and destroy you. 
And yet they take those humongous sharp teeth and they pick that little tiger up, that tiger cub up by the scruff of its neck and carry it over and it doesn't even break the skin. That's meekness, friends. You have the power to destroy. You have the power. But you don't. But choose not to. Because you care. Meekness and humility go together, friends. When we value others more than ourselves, when we value their perspective more than ourselves, not, not just their life, not that's just who they are, but their perspective ahead of our own. So what's the one main point? Well, this, this idea of, of selfish ambition versus looking out for the interests of others. Because the text is telling us to look out for the interests of others. When you think about your interests and so forth versus others' interests. If we're looking at our own interests when we're, we're living a life of, of selfish ambition. You heard me talk about in missional communities this morning, Club Jesus. We want to steer clear of Club Jesus. We want to steer clear of our motives of being here to be out of selfish ambition for what I get, for what I feel like, for what it does for me. And we make a shift over into looking for the interests of others. The interests of others here are sitting in the pews, but the interests of others are our lives too. The people that come into our lives, the people that God places in our lives, whether it's where we buy coffee, or where we, where we buy gasoline, or where we go to school, or where we work, or the family members that are in our life, whoever those are, are we looking out for the interests of others? What are the interests of the lost? Well, they don't even know what they are, but we do. They need Jesus Christ. Looking out for the interests of others. So Christ's example of selflessness and humility, the text tells us your attitude should be the same of that as Christ Jesus. What was his attitude? Well, there he is. Almighty God, creator of the universe. He looks down on humanity and he says, there's only one way to bridge the gap. There's only one way to reconcile flawed humanity with perfect God. And that's for me to be the perfect sacrifice. And so I'm going to do that. I'm going to do what I have to do to look out for the interest of others. That's what I'm going to do. It was necessary for Jesus to become the God-man. It was necessary for Him to come and live a perfect life as the sacrifice, as the God-man, to shed His own blood on the cross as a satisfaction of God's wrath, as a propitiation, a satisfaction of God's wrath, but also as atonement to make up for your and my sin. That's paid for. And by the way, the sin of the world's paid for. 1 John 2.2. 2. It's all paid for. Why? Because sin affects God. People don't go to hell for their sin. They go to hell for their unbelief. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing the word of Christ. And so how can they hear unless they've been preached to? How, how can they hear unless they've heard the message? You know, you read about that in Romans chapter 10. By the way, as an infomercial for our, uh, our Tuesday night Bible study, once we wrap up Revelation here in a couple of weeks, we're going to move right into Romans. It's going to be a wonderful study in the book of Romans. We're going to break it apart verse by verse, text by text, and talk about Romans. Very excited about that. William Temple was known to say this. He says, humility does not mean thinking less of yourself than of other people. You know, a lot of times we think with humility is, well, I just need to think less of me. That's not what it is. He goes on to say, nor does it mean having a low opinion of your own gifts. And you think, well, you know, I'm, I'm not worthy. I'm not very gifted. I'm not very smart. That's not humility. Listen. It means freedom from thinking about yourself one way or the other at all. Freedom from thinking about yourself one way or the other at all. So humility is not low self-esteem. What self-esteem? Well, self-esteem. Self-worth. What am I worth? Oh, I'm not worth very much. Self-image. Oh, I just really have a low image of myself. Self-confidence. Self-assurance. I had a friend tell me one time, you know, he's a Christian friend, and he says, you know, I feel sorry 
for the people in my life. I feel sorry for my friends. I feel sorry for my fellow Christians. I said, why? He said, because I'm supposed to love my neighbor as myself, and I don't love myself very much. That's low self-esteem, friends. And you know what? That's blasphemous. You were made in the image of God. You know what he's saying? God, you dealt me a raw deal. You made me this way, and I don't like it. Ouch. So you see, self-esteem, low or high, it does not drive our humility. It doesn't. At a reception honoring the musician Sir Robert Mayer on his 100th birthday, elderly British socialite Lady Diana Cooper, it's a true story, fell into conversation with a friendly woman who seemed to know her very well. Lady Diana's failing eyesight prevented her from recognizing her fellow guest until she peered more closely at the magnificent diamonds and realized that she was talking to Queen Elizabeth. Overcome with embarrassment, Lady Diana curtsied and stammered, Ma'am, oh ma'am, I'm sorry. I didn't recognize you without your crown. The Queen replied, It was so much Sir Robert's evening that I decided to leave it behind. You know, someone else left their crown behind. His name is Jesus Christ. He left it behind, came to earth, lived a life as the God-man, as the perfect sacrifice, shed his own blood on the cross for you and me to atone for our sin, rose from the dead to prove who he is. He's seated at the right hand of power because he is large and in charge. And that because you and I believe that that's true, and because you and I believe that that is all that is necessary for salvation to be yours and mine, we are saved and we are a regenerated being only because of that, because he left his crown behind. Humility for you and for me. And we are charged, we ought, the text says, to live a life worthy of that call. Like that, to leave our crown behind. So humility, my friends, is laying aside who you are and regarding it to be more important and remember whose we are. You are bought with a price. We're indentured servants with a debt we can never repay. We ought to live accordingly to the glory of God. Amen? So what does it mean for each of us to look out for the interests of others? Well, what is that word? Let's look at that word, interests. The relevance of others. How, what is the relevance of people in our lives? What is the significance, looking out for the significance of others in our lives? Looking out for the concerns of others in our lives. Looking out for the gain of others in our lives. Now, if someone else gains, are we at, are, are we at risk of losing? Yeah, we are. Sure. Of course. The profit of others, the benefit of others. That is our charge, to look out for the profit, for the gain, for the benefit of others in our life. That is so anti-American, isn't it? <laughs> that cuts right against the culture. But hey, isn't that what we do? We are in the world, but we're not of the world. Right? So uh, this, this idea of selfish ambition, this idea of of doing things as motivated for what's going to be good for us completely cuts against the grain of everything that we're being told here in the text today. And then Paul points to Jesus Christ as the example. If anyone deserved to be exalted, and he says he already is, exalted where the name above every name, every knee bows, every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord, and yet look what he did. And so that's what we ought to do, too. That's what we ought to do. So what can I gain if I'm looking to gain? Recognition, power, control, significance. All these back to that one thing, which is what? Our desire to feel good about you and me. Ultimately, when we make choices and decisions, isn't it because we want to feel good? 
And some of our motives, some of the things that we do, could be viewed by, even by the world, as despicable. To get gain, to feel better. But you know, the enemy's very crafty. And he can even allow us, or, or lead us, or mislead us, into doing things on the outside that look like they're pretty good for the kingdom. When the motive on the inside is for how I feel about how I did. Instead of saying glory to God. Oh, be careful of our motives. Be careful of our motives. Well, what can I gain by looking out for the interests of others? <laughs> that sounds like an oxymoron. It sounds like it, it's incompatible with the, with the statement just kind of conflicts itself. <clears throat> they might get credit for something I did. You ever think that? I did that, and they're getting credit for it. That makes me mad. I deserve the credit for that, because I did it all. I had a project at work one day, one, one time, about 20 years ago. And I, I look back on it, and remember, I kind of chuckle about it now, because I actually did do all of the work. <laughs> and the whole team was like, yep. <laughs> and I was like, and so I went to my boss, I was like, I, I did all the work on that. You know what they said? Oh yeah, well so-and-so just came in here and said the same thing. <laughs> you know what? It's amazing what can be accomplished when nobody cares who gets the credit. <clears throat> because who deserves the credit? He did it all, didn't he? What a blessing it is to be able to recognize that we didn't do it, that he did it all, right? It was John Riskin who said this, listen. I believe the first test of a truly great man is fame, power, fortune. No, <laughs> humility. I believe the first test of tr a truly great man is humility. I do not mean by humility doubt of his own power or hesitation in speaking his opinion. That's not humility, friends. But really great men have a feeling that the greatness is not in them. Wow. But through them, that they could not do or be anything else than what God made them. Friends, that's, that's the key. That's the, that's the linchpin to humility. Is to recognize that no matter how great or how insignificant you are, that God made you who you are. And He has placed you in your circumstances. And you are His. Remember whose you are, not who you are. And in so doing, count others more significant than, you, than yourself. Why? That's what Jesus did. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Andrew Murray said this, The humble man feels no jealousy or envy. Jealousy is when you're concerned that somebody's going to get something that's yours. Envy is when you want something that somebody else has. But he says, The humble man feels neither. He can praise God when others are preferred and blessed before him. He can work tirelessly when no one else will. He can bear to hear others praised while he is forgotten because he has received the spirit of Jesus who pleased not himself and who sought not his own honor. Humility. Humility. True humility. Last week we had a question. What's the difference between true humility and false humility? True humility is recognizing who did it. False humility is when you say, oh, no, 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 but we were really going, right? Bring it, bring it on a little bit more, right? So putting on the Lord Jesus, we put on the heart. And we're going to look at this. This is out of uh, Colossians chapter 3. Put on a heart of compassion, looking into the lives of others, seeing their need and desiring to help. Compassion, kindness, Reaching into the lives of those. And when is it hard to be kind? When someone's not being kind. 
It's very easy to be kind when everybody's being kind to you. I say, oh, hey, you know. But when someone's being unkind, to be kind. Meekness, we talked about that with the tiger. Long suffering. That's another way of saying patience, by the way. Long suffering. You know, it's easy to be patient when you got nothing on your agenda. It's easy to be patient when, you know, hey, I got, I got time, I'm good, we're good. But when, when you're up against a deadline, when you're hard pressed, patience, long suffering, and humility. M.R. DeHaan used to say this humility is something we should constantly pray for, yet never thank God that we have. Pray for humility, pray for it. You believe that God will give you humility if you pray for it? You bet. Sure, He will. So your attitude should be the same of that as Christ Jesus. What was His attitude? His attitude as the God man is to look at flawed humanity and say, What's the solution here? Flawed humanity has got to be reconciled to perfect God. How do I do that? How do I do that? Well, He knew always. Because you see, He's all-powerful, He's all-knowing, He's always known everything. There is no limit to His power, there's no limit to His knowledge. He has always known everything. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He is immutable, He never changes. And so God's plan all along was to come here and live a life as the God-man. He came to earth, He became the God-man lived a perfect life, shed His own blood on the cross as a perfect sacrifice because it was the only way, we read in Hebrews, that without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sin. That was the only way for the remission of sin. And so He did it. And He took all the sin of the world on Himself for you and me so that we didn't have to bear that burden. He bore it. And so he rose from the dead to prove that he is God. And he's seated at the right hand of power because he is large and in charge. And by believing that, friends, when you and I say, yes, I believe that Jesus is who he is. That he did what he said he would do. And that by doing that, and that alone, that salvation is mine, we are a regenerated being. We are a Christian and we will spend eternity with Jesus Christ. You know, Ephesians 2.8 tells us that we're saved by grace, unmerited favor. Grace is unmerited. You didn't earn it. Favor, it's given to you. Unmerited favor. If you're saved by grace and not by works. Saved by grace, not by works. So that no one should boast. Amen? And so if you have never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've never stood before humanity and said, yes, I believe that Jesus is God. I believe that He came to earth lived a perfect life as a God-man, shed His own blood on the cross as a satisfaction to God's wrath to make up and atone for my sin, and that He rose from the dead to prove who He is and be seated at the right hand. If you believe that and you've never stood before men to do that, I, I, I it challenge you to come forward and confess before men. Jesus said, if you, if you will deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. What does that mean? That means if you really truly believe it, you're going to stand here and you're going to say, I believe it. If you love somebody, you're going to hide that? You're going to say, oh, no, I don't want anybody to know. Let's keep this between us, sweetie. No. You're going to stand on the highest mountaintop and say, I love her, him. Right? The Lord Jesus Christ wants you to proclaim before men what you believe about him. That's called a public profession of faith. If you believe that, I want you to come before us. We'll come down to a time of invitation. And this is your perfect time to profess that faith in Jesus Christ publicly. If you want to unite with this beautiful body of believers in, in harmony with the loving church and to join with us and to partner with us as we reach out to the community, to the city, to the state, to the country, and to the world, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you come forward as we sing our invitation here. If you just want to come forward and uh, pray at the altar while we sing, you do that as we sing our invitation.